E Squared Online is a presentation of Pepperdine from the Church Relations Office, and we're thankful to welcome you. I am so grateful that a dear friend of mine who is part of a church that is already on the other side of reopening uh, has taken time to, uh, to join us. Uh, Barry Cameron is one of those gifted guys that if you spend 10 minutes with him, you're just like soaking up the leadership things he's sharing. But for many of you, you may not know Barry because he's the minister at the Crossroads Christian Church, a restoration church just outside of Dallas, Texas. Uh, the, uh, they opened in early May with services. And uh, Barry, who is a best-selling author, pastor, and a great leader. By the way, if you're ever looking for stewardship material, look up the ABCs of Stewardship by Barry Cameron. We've used it at churches I've served in past. So his leadership skills kind of range all the way across. He's also a father of three and got at least two grandkids. Uh, but Barry came to this church 28 years ago. Uh, there were about 188 in attendance. Today, they have a 150-acre campus in Grand Prairie, again, a suburb of Dallas. Uh, there are over 8,000 folks that they are, are ministering to. But I want to welcome uh, Barry Cameron and see if we can get Barry on screen here all the way from Grand Prairie, Texas. Thanks so much for being with us, man. Good to be with you. Thank you, Jeff. Barry, um, you have been in the papers. You guys have been online as one of the first churches. So with all of us listening, uh, first off, thank you uh, for being willing to be one of the first through the fire. I always think of the Indiana Jones movies, you know, you don't want to be the first guy through the tunnel. But if I had to send somebody through first, you are a great Indiana Jones to make it through. So share a little bit with us about what you've learned from this experience. Well, you're very kind and uh, honored to join all of you today. The, uh, the thing for us, we, when they shut us down uh, March 13th, and uh, yeah, that was a government ordered, uh, we had to go online and uh, the church didn't close. We just, they shut down our campus and we uh, moved online. And um, we began thinking, okay, this isn't gonna last forever. We gotta have a plan together. And so we, we began to plan for a Mother's Day opening. What is it gonna look like for us to be open uh, May the 10th? Now, you know, this is March. And we're already having these discussions. We're already talking. Uh, when we got into April, we said, hey, we, we really need to be ready. Um, Mother's Day could be it. And uh, then our governor uh, pulled the, the trigger quicker on us. And But we had everything in place. We had already redone all of our auditoriums, our uh, seating. We'd all gone to social distancing. We already had signs printed. We'd already ha ordered hand sanitizer, uh, gloves. We'd done all that stuff because we were getting ready for Mother's Day. Well, when he... When he said you can open the first Sunday of May, uh, I went to our elders. I said, what, what, what do we do now? And uh, their wisdom was, which I thought was very insightful, they said, why don't we go ahead and open, and this will be like a, a soft opening for us, so we'll really have our act together when uh, the next week for Mother's Day. And as it turned out, Ed, that, was, that was really a smart thing for us to do because there were still some kinks for us to work out and uh, we were really ready to go on Mother's Day, but, but we actually opened the first Sunday of May. Wow. Wow. So tell me what that first Sunday felt like. We're all wondering. <laughs> well, it was, it was amazing for me. Uh, and tomorrow I'll be filming uh, again, my message for our online services, because we're still doing that. We have thousands of people watching online uh, more than, than, than are actually coming on campus. So we film all that ahead of time, piece that all together. And it's a, it's a tremendous, undertaking tremendous production but but i have to say walking out on the platform even though there weren't thousands of people there just just several hundred uh, it was amazing it was electric uh, the people were excited uh it was very emotional um it was just it was an amazing experience to get to to have again what what we did not know was so awesome and we lost it was yeah. taken away from us so, I've got to know, believe there, there may even have been some tears, you know, did everyone just so, so thrilled just to be together again? Oh, everyone. It was very emotional. Everybody was, uh, in fact, for our decision song, we sang, uh, we're standing on holy ground. Oh. And uh, you could just tell everybody there was wiping tears away and pretty amazing, pretty amazing thing. Wow. Well, Barry, what are the top two or three things that you learned from walking through this process that it would be great if somebody had tapped you on the shoulder and told it before you started? Uh, can, you, can you give us some wisdom from uh, the other side of the mountain? Well, I got, some, I got some early on wisdom from my friend Tim Liston down at New Hope 
a church in Houston, and uh, they went through Hurricane Harvey, and it just decimated their church. Mm. And, and he said, Barry, it took us a year to get back where we were before the hurricane. Wow. And when he told me that, I thought, oh, you're nuts. That, that, that won't happen here. That's not going <laughs> to take place. And I listened to all the consultants and all the, all the church guys on these Zoom calls saying, oh, yeah, it's going to be the greatest revival since the day of Pentecost. You better be ready for twice as many people and all that. But I just didn't believe that. I thought this is going to be slow. It's going to take time. And as it turned out, that, that's exactly what our experience has been. Every week has been more than the week before. But our people have been fed such a diet of negativity and fear that, I mean, when you've been baptized and all that negative stuff, it's hard to dry off and uh, move on in faith. Mm. And so while last Sunday we saw our largest crowd yet, we still have not broke a thousand on, uh, in our attendance, but we're getting close. But that's the other thing. You can't share, you can't share that you're having a large crowd. And the picture you showed earlier, that was not since we've done social distancing. That was way before because okay. uh, we have every other road blocked off. You, you, there's two seats between uh, different families. Um, but if I was, if I, I wish I would have known earlier, uh, get laser thermometers, uh, get plenty of hand sanitizer, and get more gloves than you think you need. Okay. Because uh, as it turns out, those are the things you, you have to communicate to your people how safe this is. And also, all, we, we did something last week. We put all kinds of pictures out on our website and on social media of all the space we had and how much room people had to get away from other people. And that was very encouraging to people to know that it's not, it's not crowded. There aren't a lot of people. And uh, the other thing I would say is I think smaller churches have an edge coming back because most people, especially those who aren't in the church, they're not going to get up on Sunday morning and say, hey, let's go up there to that large church with that big campus and all those people, and let's go worship there. They're scared of that. So we have to kind of flip the script and, and talk about how much room we have and uh, talk about people being there but not talking about numbers. But, but we also have to get back to, to doing what we were doing. So we have just recently announced, as of this morning, uh, we are going to add back uh, another service, June 7th, our early service, because we can't keep pe putting people in those same services we need to add another one. Uh, we also are announcing that we'll begin limited child care. Uh, mm. daycares, daycares have opened up here in Texas, and uh, we're listening to how the parents are responding to that. We're doing all the things the daycares are doing, and even more. Um, we're planning tentatively, this will all depend on what our gov governor says, to open our children's building and have children's ministry back on the weekend of July 5th. Again, a holiday weekend when attendance should be lower, so it'll be easier to do it. But we'll have um, laser uh, thermometers, temperature takers, and every adult, every child that comes in the children's building will have to have their, their temperature taken, which just makes people feel safer. Yes. Well, and, and when I think about, <clears throat> I've heard different stories from different folks about how the church staff kind of sets an example and the volunteers of what and how important this social distancing is. I mean, it just takes one pastor or one, you know, greeter volunteer that says, oh, I've got to hug Betty. And right. all of a sudden, well, forget it, Katie, bar the door. How, how did you prep your volunteers and your staff for these weekends? Well, the first thing we did before we, we opened up was to have a big leadership meeting and lay everything out that we knew at the time to them. But we also have a host in every service that welcomes people as they walk in, tells them, you know, folks, you need to, you can sit anywhere you want, but you have to allow so much room between uh, the next family. Uh, we also dismiss people by rows mm. so they can't bunch up. Uh, we tell people no fist bumps, no high fives, no hugs, none of that. There's no touching. We don't, we don't have programs. There's no transactional business that takes place. In other words, we don't hand programs to people. We don't pass offering bags. Uh, we don't pass communion trays. We have disposable communion that uh, people take. We, uh, everything's non-transactional, no food service. Mm. And we encourage families to come and worship together, bring your kids, bring their iPad, bring, a, bring some headphones. We don't mind as long as they're there with you. Um, but we are, gonna, we are taking the steps now to gradually begin moving back to uh, what we all know will be our new normal. And it's not gonna be easy yeah. and it's not gonna be fast. 
and the online uh, programs are going to need to continue for all those folks who are saying, man, I'm, I'm hanging longer than everybody else here. Uh, I, I'm, I've heard some pastors say, I don't think we're ever going to be able to drop what we've started doing now online. Would you agree? Yeah, I think online is very important. One, one thing that people have noticed across the country and probably across the world is their, their numbers have dropped. When uh, we all first when the government shut us down and we were all online and people were seeing these unbelievable numbers and we were hearing people report uh, tens of thousands of people and all that. Well, a couple of things drove that. Number one, there were a lot of people out there who thought, is this the end of the world? Mm. So, so we had their interest. Uh, number two, they had nothing else going on. And so what happened on Sunday mornings, you'd have people that were checking out four or five different worship services online and, uh, but now it's online fatigue has begun to set, set in and the funnel effect has taken place. And, and, and to just quickly explain that, the funnel effect means that what happens no matter in what business, no matter in food service, in entertainment, in churches, online services, that, that, that it'll always funnel down to the very best there is. So in other words, I can't hold a candle to Andy Stanley or Levi Lusco or or some of these other guys have phenomenal online messages, they're gonna win out. That's where people are gonna go. And the guys have the best worship, like Hillsong, some of these other places, they're gonna, they're gonna draw people. So that's why we're gonna see our numbers keep going down, and, but that's not a bad thing. Because you'll, you'll actually find out these are the people that are really interested in your ministry. And I, and I would just say this, yeah, online's gonna be a part of us for a long time. It was a part of us before before this, this whole pandemic started. But, but online church does not produce frontline saints. There is no evidence, no research anywhere in the world that, that, that proves that someone who's online will all of a sudden become this phenomenal frontline saint. There is nothing like being there. Just like picking up a food from a restaurant, and bringing it home and you go, oh man, this is, this is great. It's, it can't compare to what it's like to actually be in that restaurant. And the mm -hmm. same thing is true about the church. And I think we need to encourage our people. There's nothing like being there. And uh, you need to come back and hear from Pastor Bob or Pastor Joe and uh, our people, our ministry, our secret sauce. And when people come back, they'll, they'll, uh, they'll agree with you. And they'll say, I'm glad to be home. Wow. I'm, uh, I'm going to take away that line uh, to struggle with. You can, can online church uh, create frontline saints? And, and I know that relationship has always been the heart of any church. I know folks from your congregation, so I know that's the truth, and the folks who are on this call. We're going to open up uh, the chat lines or encourage you. If you've got a question for Barry, he's been down the road a little farther than we have, uh, shoot those in the chat lines, and I I'll ask him. And I've got, I've got at least one here to, to start with. Um, Barry, here's a, 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 a kind of a, a pretty simple question, but uh, you talked about communion. Can you say a word about baptism? Oh, yeah, that's been the hard one. In fact, uh, what we've done, I mean, we don't believe there's a sinner's prayer anywhere in the Bible, but sinners ought to pray. And, but how do you tell people online that, you know, they need, to, they need to ask God to forgive them, and they need to repent of their sins, they need to do all that stuff, and they need to be baptized too. That's just what we tell them. Uh, I, I have them pray with me online, and as soon as we're done praying, I say, now listen, if you just made that decision, you want to give your life to Christ, you need to be baptized. Why? Because the Bible says so. And you need to, and we tell them, if you live in the DFW area, and we have, we, we have baptized a ton of people during this uh, crisis. We do it safe, safely. We do it uh, social distancing. We do it privately in our outdoor baptistry. But uh, we strongly encourage people that. And we also tell them, if you don't live in our area, find a Bible teaching, Bible believing church. Tell them that you just decided to give your life to Jesus Christ and you want to be baptized and they'll help you. So we try to encourage them that way. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a sticky wicket because you're online and you've got to encourage them to, uh, you know, they've, they've got to go all the way. You can't just, right. decide, just raise a hand, fill out a card and you're in. It's not that well, at all. I'm just curious, what, what is a social distance baptism look like? Can you, can you kind of describe well, how, uh, how, how, you, how you guys have chosen to do that if you would? Well, it's only only one family at a time that nobody else can be in. If you're in the same family, and we baptized a family uh, last Friday, and uh, they're they're the only ones allowed in the baptistry with a, with a pastor. Uh, we don't have the same pastor baptizing everybody. 
uh, and we don't have all kinds of people. Like if someone goes in to change, uh, they have to come out for their bab baptism before someone else goes in. And we have cleaners that go in there and clean everything. In fact, all of our services, uh, one of the reasons why we release people by rows is so our cleaning teams can come in. They wipe down every seat, every armrest, every counter, everything. Wow. And uh, it's a massive undertaking. And that's one of the other things I would tell guys, if you're going to open up, you've got to have a huge team of people to clean before, between, and after services, because that's, we, we got to do everything we can. I mean, if Walmart can do it, Costco, Kroger, they can all do it. I think the church can do it better. And so far we've been, we think we are. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So are you masked up and gloved up when you baptize somebody? No, and I haven't baptized anyone because my, my personal physician uh, told me I shouldn't even be back at church. In fact, uh, when she contacted me and said, hey, so when's your church planning to uh, open back up and have services? I said, well, this is actually our fourth week. And I said, uh, she goes, oh, my word, you're not around people. And I'm not. I never leave the platform. Uh, no one's close to me. I have security that, that uh, keeps me away from that. And uh, so I haven't been involved in that because of my heart issues. Uh, with a pacemaker, but we have other staff uh, guys who've done that. They don't wear a mask in the baptistry. Uh, we do have greeters at our church that wear masks. They all wear gloves, um, but we don't tell people you have to wear a mask to come to church. We've had some people who do wear them when they come in. They take them off when they sing uh, for worship, but uh, we want people to be comfortable, and we just want them to come. Absolutely. Um, here's a question. Um, how do you handle fearful members who are somehow feeling kind of shamed that they're not showing up? Well, we don't, we don't shame anybody. We've told them from the very beginning, if you, uh, if, number one, if you have the virus or if you have any kind of health conditions, if you're in the at-risk community, you watch us online and stay with us online until you get to that place where you can join us. And we're going to pray that the day comes when you can. But uh, no, we can't. You know, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons why uh, early on, we decided no, we wouldn't do any interviews. We, we were contacted by uh, all the major networks, Fox and Friends, um, uh, CNN was really relentless trying to get us to be on there. We just decided this wasn't about interviews. This wasn't about um, making a name for ourselves, whatever, because one of the things is that we were careful about. We didn't want to be a part of, well, this is the way to do it, and the way they're doing it is not the way to do it, or shaming people or whatever. We didn't want to be a part of that. Yeah. We we decided this is what we believe we should do. We don't think we have all the answers. Uh, we've learned a lot. We're willing to share that. We've shared that with all kinds of people. But definitely, you don't want to discourage people. If, if, they, if they feel fearful, and a lot of people do, um, we need to encourage them. Walk by faith, but you can do that at home for a while until you feel like you can come back. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, this is a really intriguing question that's come in, and uh, I, I, I know you can handle this. I, I'm not sure what I'd say. Uh, but one of our <clears throat> ministers said, you know, there has been some surveys or studies done about how the depth of our relationships in our churches is really what's going to get people through this coronavirus tunnel and out the other side. And as you said, online, you know, that's, it's hard to build relationships online. Uh, this emphasizes small groups uh, and emphasizes relationships and depth. What, what are you guys doing, one, with regard to, you know, small groups, and, and two, what are you seeing and feeling about, uh, well, you said it, online and frontline uh, uh, Christians? So swing at that in any way you want to, brother. Yeah, all of our small groups have done phenomenal. They all went uh, either Zoom or um, Google Groups. Uh, they did them all online. And uh, they worked. That's the amazing part about it. They worked. People love that. And that was great. I would say this. This Sunday is going to be the 11th week that people have not been in church. And if you know anything about habits, there's a great book called Atomic Habits by James Clear. And he talks about how hard it is to get in good habits, how easy it is to get in bad habits, and how hard it is to change both of them. Mm. And now we've, we've got people who have not been in church. They've not been in a church campus for 11 weeks. Uh, it's not going to take too many more weeks to have half a year. If, if people are not allowed to be in church. Now, I don't think you're going to lose your faithful people. I think because of their relationships, because of their commitment to Christ, the faithful people are going to be back no matter what. But I do think there are some people on the fringe. There are some people who might have been attenders, who might have been coming, that they're going to be sitting there after, and they may already be saying this. 
And, um, you know, the wife turns to the husband and says, um, hey, you know, we don't go to that church anymore. So you're not still sending money there, are you? Well, yeah, I have been. Well, I don't think we need to do that. We don't even go there. We watch online. And, and I think the first thing you'll see is their money will drop off. And then mm. the second thing is if they develop habits of not coming to church, it's going to be really hard to get them back. I mm. talked to one, uh, one church leader that you would know and good friend, great guy. And I told him about my concern about the bad habits that people were getting in of uh, not going to a church campus. And he told me, he goes, well, that's us. And he said, we've kind of enjoyed getting up and having a leisurely breakfast and uh, watching the 11 o'clock service of our church. And we could do this. And I said, hey, hold the phone, man. Hold the phone. You can't be saying that. And I'm, I'm not telling you that as a church leader. I'm telling you that as a fellow Christian. We can't. I mean, Jesus was never about, uh, now, well, I want to make sure you're comfortable here. I want to make sure this is convenient for you. That's absolutely the opposite of Jesus. In fact, one of the things I've noticed, a lot of guys have been taking surveys. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, Jesus never took a survey. Uh, Moses didn't take a survey. I mean, you go through the Bible, these guys didn't take surveys. They did what they knew God wanted them to do. And I think leaders don't put their finger in there and see which way the wind's blowing before they make a decision. I mean, we should be smart. We should follow the advice of medical doctors and people who know, but uh, ultimately we have to listen to God and follow his direction. Mm. And I think if mm. we do, I think faithful people will follow us and they'll be back. Well, that's a, that's a very scary phrase, faithful people, uh, because as you were describing that uh, pastor, um, I, I, <clears throat> I have to confess there have been moments when I thought, wow, Sunday feels so, uh, so different. I know that our faith is not uh, all wrapped around being together, but as you said, being together is something, you know, God came up with this. We didn't invent church. Uh, you know, Jesus gave us a meal that we took. So there was, you know, being together was, was part of the process. But Barry, let me, let me ask you a, a question. You touched on it. Uh, I know you've done a lot in stewardship work. Tell me, um, tell me what things you'd say to folks from your experience about the issue of giving, supporting budgets. Uh, you know, I can hear the question in my head, well, you know, do we really need to pay? I mean, the pastor, you know, he's just recording a sermon and, and things really aren't even happening for our teens. How are you addressing that with your congregation and what wisdom can you share with us about stewardship in this time? Well, financially, I mean, I, I've never asked people to subscribe to a budget. We have asked people to give uh, to build buildings, but uh, pe people should give because it's a privilege to give. You know, it's, mm. that's one of the things that that is a mark of Christianity. That's not a mark of anything else. And uh, giving is a part of our worship. And, and if God never did another thing for me, I should still give and I should give him all, all that I have. I've been preaching through Nehemiah uh, during this whole crisis. We didn't change our, our uh, study at all. And it's ironic how every single uh, study of Nehemiah has been just exactly what we were dealing with uh, that week. In fact, um, uh, this Sunday's message is from Nehemiah uh, chapter 9. The title of the message is, How Does a Nation Turn Back to God? Mm. You think that's timely for what we're going through? I mean, it's been you know, you'd almost think that God was involved in that in some yeah, way. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, last, week, last week, we talked about the Feast of Booths and the Feast of Tabernacles that they had. And one of the things I told our people is, we don't have annual feasts that we observe. Those were for the Jews. But we do have weekly reminders one of them is the Lord's Supper, communion. We observe that. That's a weekly reminder of what Jesus did for us and the fact that he's returning for us. That's a, that's a weekly reminder. The second weekly reminder is tithing or giving. You know, in the, in the Bible, Malachi chapter 3, it says, bring the tithe. Don't, don't send it. Don't, I understand with online giving and all that. But God's intention was for us to bring that with us to worship because we need. there's some other things he wanted us to remember. There's some other things he wanted to teach us. But, but giving is, is a vital part of who we are. And I, and I said Sunday, I, I'm not a tither. And I don't believe anybody should be a tither. I believe everybody should give more than that. Tithing is where it starts. But I think we got to keep teaching our people when the text allows it. We should share that. But one of the things we've told our people since the very beginning is we've used the hashtag Crossroads Strong. Mm -hmm. And we told our people, we need you to help us keep the church strong. If we're going to help others, we need your help. And so I think, I think encouraging your people 
that um, they got to keep giving. And by the way, I don't know what anybody else says, but ministry is harder now than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we could do it on campus and have everybody gather on, that's much easier. And um, so, so, so people who would say, well, you know, my church doesn't need the money. They need the support now. And your, your minister, your preacher needs your prayers now more than ever because it's harder now than it's ever been. But, yeah, just continue to encourage your people to give. Second thing is to thank people that they do give. I send an email out every week that just thank people for uh, everything they've done to help us help other people, keep our church strong. But um, it's a challenge, and it will be a challenge until Jesus returns. Yeah. Um, you, you mentioned what we do for other people. Last, uh, uh, last question, and I'm here, I'm being handed one more. Um, what about uh, touching the, the community? Um, what, what have you guys experienced? Any ideas or things that, that you've uh, come across as far as how to be good neighbors and represent Christ as well as the church during this time? Well, we've asked our people to uh, donate items. In fact, we've had a list on our website of items that they could donate so we could help needy families. And um, we've had, I, I don't even know how many people that we've helped. We've also uh, supported five different food banks in our area and uh, told them right at, right at the very beginning, no matter what happens, we're going to support you every month and uh, give you finances to help you do your business. And when they did videos to thank us, uh, most of them couldn't talk. In fact, one of them did a video and uh, there's nobody talking. It's because they were weeping. And they said, we couldn't, we couldn't have made it without the support of Crossroads to help us financially to get the food to give to people. We, we have, whenever we would have food in our um, uh, main lobby, the people had donated. And we, we allowed people to come by the front of our church. We'd have people go out with gloves, get their donation. And uh, people were also able to pick up uh, disposable communion when they did that so they could worship at home. And, but whenever we'd get extra items in our um, lobby, we would get rid of it as quick as we could, either get it to a food bank or get it to a needy family. So we've helped a ton of people uh, during this crisis. And one of the things that we've, we've also done is we've had crisis donations where people can uh, donate cash. Uh, my wife and I, we, we decided early on that uh, every week of this crisis, we were gonna give an extra $100 above and beyond our normal giving. Number one, God's blessed us incredibly where we can do that. But number two, we believed early on, at some point, people are going to need help with a mortgage payment. They're going to need help with electricity, uh, utility bills, whatever. So we wanted to be a part of that and lead the way in that to create some finances so that when people do need that help, we can help them as well. So I think both of those uh, mm. in, in-kind donations, but also cash donations are terrific. Super. Super. Um, let me, uh, and this is just a logistics question, but somebody asked, where do you buy all your hand sanitizer and the gloves? I mean, I know you've got to have lots and lots of it. Is there a, a secret resource you'd tell us, or do you guys just go stake out Target? Yeah, there's a, no, 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 no. We, uh, we've gotten a lot of stuff through Amazon. Uh, there are also uh, delivery uh, companies like Cisco uh, that you can uh, talk to. Uh, believe it or not, Outreach Magazine was making a hand sanitizer and some other stuff available. You can check with them, but we would ask people in our church, if you know anywhere where we can get gloves or hand sanitizer, in fact, we even ask our people to uh, donate that to help us to make sure we had enough. And uh, supplies are easier to get now, but there's still some kind of wait time. Mm -hmm. But even if someone is not opening right now, I'd go ahead and start ordering gloves and hand sanitizer all that, and anybody that needs help, if they contact our office, uh, I'll make sure our people give them whatever address, whatever uh, contacts we have to help you. Well, fantastic. Barry, uh, close with one word to the small church minister who at this point may be he or maybe just one or two on staff, and he's thinking, oh, Lord, how am I supposed to do all of this? What would be your word of encouragement? Well, there are people out there that will help you. And, mm -hmm. um, you, know, that's, you know, don't be afraid to say, hey, can you help me? Um, we've had all kinds of churches call us and ask for materials. Uh, I, I did a phone interview with a, uh, a church of God in Christ out in uh, Washington that runs 2,800. Never met those people before, but they were stunned. When, when, when we were done, he said, Barry, I want you to thank your senior pastor for allowing you to spend time with us. And I said, well, that's kind of who I am. He goes, oh, my word, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. So, so number one, there, there, there are people that will help you. Number two, Keep showing up, keep doing what's right, 
Mm -hmm. Watch what God does. Amen. Amen. Well, Barry, I, uh, I want you to thank your senior minister there uh, <laughs> for, uh, for, <laughs> for letting you be on this call. Hey, what's one thing we can pray for the Cameron family about? Well, I think the thing to pray is just that uh, we'll be faithful in this whole situation. Yeah. Uh, last Sunday was the first time in 10 weeks my entire family was able to worship together in one place. My grandsons, oh, wow. uh, my son, his wife, my daughter, her wife, my, my other daughter, and all of us in the same service. And it was very emotional, and uh, it was a blessing to be able to have that again. And, and I know where those blessings come from. And so... That's, that's just been such a great blessing. I know there's so many families. There, there are thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of families all around the world that don't have that blessing yet. And we need to pray yeah. that we'll stay faithful, stay on the front line, provide the ministry people need so when they can come Amen. back, they'll, they'll know what that feeling is too. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you, brother. Thank you. And uh, Thank prayers you. for you at Crossroads. Uh, if you would like to reach out to, to Barry, we'll make sure we get an, an email where you can uh, reach out to him there at Crossroads Christian Church in Grand Prairie. God bless y'all. Uh, my dad was from Texas. He'd be so proud of good things that are happening in, in that state.